Now on Talking Solutions, want to welcome back into the studio Liz Ortenberger, the Executive Director for Safe Nest. Thank you so much for having me. It is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Yes, it is. So I need to check in and see how things are going these days with Safe Nest. Safe Nest is happily celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. So as the largest and longest lasting organization in Nevada focused on domestic violence, we wish we didn't need to exist, but we are here and our numbers are unfortunately for Nevada very high. I hate this. Last time I checked, we were actually a little bit above the national average, which in itself is way too high. Yeah, we are actually well above the national average for domestic violence. We are second worst state for women from a lethality standpoint. So our murders related to domestic violence are really high here. All around as a community, this is an epidemic that we need to take some serious notice of. Well, all of this illustrates why it's so important that we have domestic violence shelters like Safe Nest available to help. Yes, and it's important that people understand that confidential shelters are really a critical piece of the domestic violence puzzle. Right, because women or victims of domestic violence are most likely to be murdered or brutally injured when they are deciding to leave or have left a partner, an abuser. And so that confidentiality piece of the shelter work, which we're incredibly proud of in this internet day and age, does not make it easy to keep a shelter location confidential, but we're very proud to have operated that program now for 40 years. You know, I found out years ago when I was donating a bunch of clothing items to Safe Nest, and I was like, where do I take it? So I just called and they helped me arrange everything, but I didn't really know what place I could go drop it off. That in itself is a key to why Safe Nest is run so beautifully. Yes, yeah, so we have a wonderful donation center program that all happens outside of the shelter. And then what our shelter residents need, we use an inventory system to find and provide for them. But yeah, no one intersects with the shelter unless there's staff there or they're a resident. Got to keep them safe. Even when volunteers come into play and they want to come in and help, you've got to vet all of those people. People, you've got to make sure that the women and the children who are there at Safe Nest, that they're safe in every situation. Right. And it gets more complicated with our ever expanding internet world, right? We have to make sure that the people that we bring into shelter, they're safe around them. So volunteers and staff are heavily vetted when they come into the shelter program. But then we also have to make sure that everybody understands the rules of confidentiality. You know, that's as simple as a victim coming into the shelter and not turning off the GPS locator on her phone. That's just one example of many things that we walk through to make sure that the shelter location is confidential and that the residents and the staff and volunteers are safe. It seems so simple. Turn off the GPS on the phone. Right. How many of us with smartphones have noticed how they seem to know exactly where that nearest restaurant is or right. grocery store? Yep, absolutely. And then you think of other things like Google Earth and Zillow and all of those kinds of things. We just had some legislation passed in the last session about not being having our parcel number be public that you could, you know, theoretically locate back that the parcel belong to Safe Nest and by process of elimination, find us. And so we got legislation passed so that we can keep it private. We work with Google Earth. We work with Bing. We work with all the major providers to ensure that our locations are kept private. And that is a critical, critical piece of a domestic violence program. It's important, but it adds extra layers of hassle, other things that you have to watch out for to protect the people in the shelter. Yes, absolutely. Liz Ortenberger is with us, the executive director of Safe Nest. It is Domestic Abuse Awareness Month, and we've got to bring up this topic. It is way too prevalent. Liz, you were mentioning a moment ago that there had been some moves by the Nevada State Legislature that assist you in helping to protect the location of the domestic violence shelter. Does that mean that our state legislature is aware of so, these problems? Absolutely. In some areas, our legislation has acted in a very proactive way and to help provide situations where victims aren't meeting repeated barriers. For example, making sure that if somebody's a victim of domestic violence, they can't automatically be evicted from their home or their apartment for that reason. But in other cases, as a state, we are wildly behind. For example, our education in the schools, particularly middle school and high school, is really watered down. And it's not a real conversation with kids around what healthy relationships should look like. This is not a religious or a political issue. This is simply, let's have a conversation with kids around what healthy relationships relationship should be. And more and more kids don't have access to good quality education, whether or not they have good role models at home, we don't know. Certainly the media is not necessarily where we want kids to turn or to their friends to get answers. But where do children turn to find out how to prevent this? Because we will work in the victim space until the very last victim needs help. But what would be fantastic for us as a state is to say, how do we start to prevent this from happening? You know, if a beach lifeguard was looking at 60,000 rescue 
rescues a year, the beach would figure out how to keep people out of the water. We're not looking at it the same way. We keep providing services for victims and we will continue to do that. But how are we preventing this from happening? We got to raise our kids right. Mm -hmm. And education in the schools is a big part of that. And how kids have access to healthy relationship education is a big part of that. You know, talking to kids about early indicators and what's jealousy versus a healthy relationship and the early identifiers that the relationship you're in is not healthy are in very important conversations. And oftentimes, as a parent myself, you don't necessarily always know how to have those conversations with your kids. School needs to be a part of that. Society needs to be a part of that. This needs to be something that we talk about and not just, oh, it's so horrible that our stats are high. Our stats are high. Let's do something about it as a community. Well, I see that we're making some progress in some other areas also with our kids, like trying to be more upfront in talking about the unacceptable behavior that is bullying Mm -hmm. in all of the different venues, including social media, besides the one-to-one in-person situation. We're working on a lot of things, but domestic violence also, as you said, needs to be part of the conversation. This makes perfect sense. Liz, for someone who is not as aware of the numbers, when we talk about domestic violence being a huge issue in Southern Nevada, even higher than the national average Mm -hmm. right here, Mm -hmm. how many domestic violence victims are you helping every year? We respond to over 35,000 domestic violence victims a year. And so those are unduplicated calls on the hotline, which is about 30,000 residents in our shelter. It is our counseling program and our court advocacy program. And so in a basket, we serve about 35,000 victims a year, unduplicated in domestic violence. Our Metro Police Force responds to 60,417 calls, which is the call code for domestic violence a year. This is incredibly high. And I always tell people, look, we've been chatting for about 15 minutes. We've probably had three to five calls to our hotline. If we were to talk for an hour, it would be 15 to 20 calls. So that gives you an idea of the pace and the reality of this epidemic in Southern Nevada. That puts it in perspective. Mm -hmm. You're mentioning Metro. They are certainly well aware. Mm Mm-hmm of the domestic violence shelter that is Safe Nest. All of this is going on 24-7. Yes. There are no days off, and we are so proud of our work with Metro. In fact, we're piloting a new program out of the Northwest Area Command where our responders will actually respond right after the police respond to a domestic violence call. So once that scene is safe, two of our volunteer advocates will go in and provide actually at the scene support for victims so that we can try to end this cycle before it starts. And this is a serious issue because the police themselves say that a domestic violence call is one of the most dangerous calls they make a call on all day. Yes, absolutely. And I had the opportunity to do a ride along recently. They have a great way that they triage the calls. They take domestic violence calls incredibly seriously, but they're also acutely aware that when they arrive in uniform and typically male, that oftentimes is putting them two step back. And so I just applaud the Northwest Area Command for calling us and saying, how can we work together? And here we come in with advocates that are able to respond at the scene. So that barrier of it being a police potentially a male police person, how do we break down those barriers? Because they identified that as, look, how can we better serve victims at the scene? And so these aren't necessarily victims that are in a huge amount of distress at that moment. There was enough distress that a domestic violence call was made. Now the barriers are broken down. We can go in, provide some support, and we can also provide follow-up, all with a hope that by providing that face-to-face contact in the beginning, we now are creating a better vehicle to serve those victims before police are responding four or five, seven times or in worse case scenarios responding to homicides. That is a very positive approach so that we can get those numbers down so that we can work on this better. I wonder too, Liz Ortenberger, Executive Director with Safe Nest Domestic Violence Shelter, from the perspective of someone, I'm going to include myself in this category, listeners who are so blessed to have never been faced with a domestic violence situation in their own lives. Mm -hmm. And that is truly being blessed. What can we do to help the people around us. Because the numbers themselves tell us that someone in our circle, somebody we work with, someone in our family, someone in our church, our neighborhood, someone is being affected by domestic violence. Is there something we should look for? It's hard to say, hey, these are the five things, and if somebody has four of them, they're probably a victim of domestic violence. But what you look for is potentially a neighbor where you never see a partner, but you know there's a partner and you know there's children, those kinds of situations. You want to be ready and available to call 911 if you're hearing something happening next door. You want to look for people potentially in your congregation who are withdrawn and not part of it. They seem to not be engaged in any way. But what you want to do is be really careful about how you respond, because we don't want to put victims 
victims in more danger than they're in, right? So a lot of times what I tell people to do is look, call the hotline, explain what you're seeing and ask a hotline advocate who can hear all of the details of what you're seeing, who can really provide you with some great advice on how to approach that. But sometimes it's as easy as getting the hotline number into somebody's hands. And that's not necessarily handing it to them directly because that could be putting a person in danger. But what if you notice that you had somebody, for example, in your congregation who do have some reasons for concern? Why not ask when announcements are being made if an announcement can't be made about SafeNest? Saying that hotline number, giving them an opportunity to call or at least retain that information. So those are some sort of like, how do you get that hotline number in front of somebody who might need it without putting them in more danger? That's a great idea yeah. because it's not targeting one person Correct. individually. It's just Correct. shotgunning it out to everyone in the room. Yes. And it's important to remember domestic violence is incredibly complicated. On average, a victim will leave their batter seven times and return before they finally make that final move away from their batterer. What we want to do is support that entire process. We want to withdraw judgment. We want to realize that we have not walked a mile in that person's shoes and they are making the right decisions that they believe are right for them at that time and give them the space to do that and support them without judgment, which is really hard, especially if it's a loved family member who you see repeatedly returning to a batterer. But getting that hotline phone number in front of them, getting them to an advocate, getting them to counseling, those kinds of things are where the support can happen. A lot of times family members, you know, they want to go in and remove somebody from a situation. And I would never say it's right or it's wrong, but get the right information. And really what we know is that a victim's ready to be their best advocate when they're ready to be their best advocate. So calling the hotline, getting some confidence, talking through their situation, safety planning, that's going to be the best thing for someone in a domestic violence scenario. And as a friend, just giving that information lets the person who may be in danger know that you're there. And when you express that, it also, I would imagine, means you're ready to listen. Yes. And you're not alone. And it is so easy for victims to, especially when you think about the ways that domestic violence can happen, it's very easy for victims to blame themselves, to feel like they're at fault. There's some deficit or flaw in their character that's causing this to happen. And that's not the case. You're in an unhealthy relationship with someone who is using power and control to get what they want in an unhealthy way from you. You are not flawed. Call the hotline, get help, get support. Let's get you out of that situation and on the road to having a different life. Of course, Liz Ortenberger, I will include in our Talking Solutions Facebook page the information we're discussing today, including links. Great. The hotline phone number obviously needs yes. to just be out there yes. for everyone. 702 646 4981 is the hotline number. So commit that to memory, give that out to friends, even on a scrap of paper, however it can work for you. But keep the victim safe, get the number in front of them and get them to call. And hopefully the need won't be there for them to actually call. The fact that you're concerned and you're expressing and saying, in case you ever need it, number one, I'm here. Yeah. Number two, I'll listen. Yeah. Number three, here's the hotline. Yes. And another thing that folks can do is if you're in a situation where you believe domestic violence is happening, we have plenty of collateral we can put in places. We can put Klingons on mirrors. We can put advertising in the back of bathroom stalls. If you're seeing a particular need, you know, one of our great partnerships is with the Women's Health Organization. That's really helping train gynecologists around what to look for in domestic violence because sometimes that's the only five or ten minutes a victim may have with someone that they could privately share what's happening and how to respond to that. So if in your workplace you would like training on how to identify, we absolutely do that and how to support and how to help people move out of that situation. It's true that a lot of women who are victims of domestic violence are being controlled. Mm -hmm. They don't go to the grocery store by themselves. Right. They don't go shopping on their own. Yeah. They don't go out to do things where they have time away from their abuser. Yes. Yeah. And we've seen cases that run the gamut of how victims are controlled, but it's certainly here, it is an absolute epidemic. So it's important that we exist. You know, it's our 40 year anniversary. Let's not celebrate 80. Nothing would give me more pleasure, not because safeness goes away for lack of funding, but because this epidemic is gone from our society. I would love to not call you. <laughs> <laughs> we could get together for coffee and talk about something totally. Yeah. Yeah, I could pick up another nonprofit. I go with that. It would be great for this one to not have to exist. It is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. That's why we've asked Liz Ortenberger, the executive director of Safe Nest, to come in and talk with us. Liz, we always ask on Talking Solutions, what can we do? 
to help you. There's really three things that folks can do to help Safe Nest out. One is be the advocate. Make sure you know the hotline phone number that you're prepared to provide support or you're just able to talk about Safe Nest and domestic violence with your group of people. The other is we love monetary donations, as do most nonprofits, but giving to us all that money stays in Clark County. Most of it stays in Las Vegas. And we also serve Boulder City and Mesquite and Overton. So that money stays local. Those gifts are much appreciated and they go directly to help helping victims get the support that they need. And the other is to donate lightly used clothing or soft goods, so shoes, lightly used small household items to our donation center. What we do is we screen for what we need for our victims and make sure that they're supported. And then we monetize all of the other clothing and everything that comes in, which really helps fuel the engine of Safe Nest. So there's three ways to help. Any of those are perfect. All of those are great, but we love people to be engaged with us. And we have fantastic people who support us, but we can always use more. When you mentioned gently used clothing items, I've got to believe that nearly all of the women and children who come to Safe Nest Mm -hmm. don't have that because you don't have the time to gather it when you are escaping a dangerous situation. Yeah, it certainly depends on the situation and the safety plan that was in place for you to be able to leave the situation. But yeah, a lot of times what we see is kids coming in with one teddy bear or garbage bag full of clothes and mom might have two garbage bags full of clothes because they did. They grabbed what they could and they fled in the time frame that it was safe for them to flee. So absolutely, our donation center program is key to what we do in supporting our victims and fueling our economic engine. So if you got money, great. Yes. If you don't, you still might have some things that would work beautifully absolutely. to be donated and always to be there for the victims with the hotline number. Yes. Since it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, is this the sort of thing that you celebrate with any kind of special events for Safe Nest? Well, this year is particularly challenging because of the shooting on the first of the month and incredibly sad in many ways for our community. So we wanted to make sure that we created space for our victims to heal because some cases this is sort of doubly traumatic, right? What's happening in your own life and then this sort of horrific event within our community. But generally on a year where something like this has happen. We do candlelight vigils to remember the victims. Actually, Metro had their candlelight vigil before the shooting happened. We remembered victims who had been killed in domestic violence over the course of the year. But with all of our residents and folks that use our services, we celebrate almost every day that you've taken the first step from moving from crisis to confidence. And so this is a month that, from a marketing perspective, is fantastic for us to talk about and educate. And as an agency, we honor the month because it's also our birth month. We were born in October. 40 40 years years. ago. We're officially over the hill. But it's an interesting epidemic to celebrate, but yet also always put in context. But I'll tell you what we are celebrating is that in September, we had 10 families move out of our shelter. We had three women get full-time employment. All the 10 families moved into permanent housing and not one victim returned to her batter last month. So we celebrate those kinds of stats. And that's what keeps us going. As an agency, we need the bright spots. And there are so many bright spots spots. Sometimes I'm over at shelter and it's the first time a child rides a bike or kids are just laughing on the playground while moms are sitting and they're having informal therapy because they're talking to each other. But this recognition that I'm not alone, that I'm going to get through this. We have a post-residence panel that works a lot with women who've been through the program, who work with women that are in the program. And it's just an incredible community of survivors when you can get through it. So we celebrate that every day. It's a new start. Yeah. And what my post-resident panel will tell you is it's not easy. There are plenty of setbacks. There are plenty of barriers along the way from having the energy and being able to find that job to getting your kids, if you have kiddos, getting them in consistent schooling. All of these pieces along the way, everything feels difficult. But when you finally turn around and say, I made it, there's a light to that. And then your new life with all of its struggles begins begins in terms of being able to not be in an unhealthy relationship. It's not easy, but boy, there's a lot of pride involved with getting there. Yes. All the links, phone numbers will be on the Talking Solutions Facebook page. Great. Along with the podcast of our discussion today. Perfect. Liz Ortenberger, thank you so much for coming to tell us what's going on with SafeNest on Talking Solutions. Thanks for having me.